<laughs> All right, we are recording and hello everybody. This is Quicks of Politics. Uh, the social commentary podcast uh, that deals with the intersections of all things political. We have a very special guest here, Councilwoman Legina Washington of Inkster, or as I know her, just Legina Washington, who is my good friend. Um, we've been connected since about 2020. Um, we were fellow councilwomen during the pandemic, watching the world pivot in, in transitional ways. And so, um, Legina, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I really appreciate appreciate you, Ernestine, for inviting me to quit the politics. Um, it's long overdue, so I really appreciate it. I'm really excited that you um, allowed me on your podcast. Um, I am a city councilwoman from the city of Inkster, uh, which is a small city um, in Western Wayne. Um, it's 6.2 square miles, so it's a small city, very knitted, small knitted community. Um, and I was elected in 2020 um, and have a four year term. So actually in November, November the 7th is our election. And this will be my last year in my term. And I am a long, long life native of the city of Inkster. Lived here my whole life, uh, born and raised here. Went to Cherry Hill, uh, performed arts, which was a middle school and elementary before they actually um, got rid of the Inkster public school system. Um, and they ended up going to John Glenn High School um, when all the actual students ended up splitting into different cities and having to go to different districts. Um, and served in the community for a long time, helping in other, um, in churches, helping around uh, community organizations nonprofits and been doing um, working in the city for a long time. So I just really wanted to give back to the community that raised me. And I don't really see it so funny, you know, they, you know, we, we're called elected officials and I see right, it more right. as a public servant and me giving back mm -hmm. to the community that raised me and gave back to me. So it, it has been a journey. Um, you know, just with politics itself, you know, ups and downs, but just being able to serve the my constituents, which I look at as family, has been um, a very a, a blessing for sure. All right, all right. Well, thank you. And I did like I jumped right into the introduction, and I, I typically like read a little bit about your bio. Um, and so you have a a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from uh, University of Michigan Flint. And um, you also have been a legislative staffer. And so you have knowledge of state, local and municipal politics. And, you know, um, just a very dynamic woman in all of 33 years old, not to put your age on blast or anything. Oh. This, is, this is why I wanted to have you on the show because, you know, I think that when you're young, black female and elected, there is, you know, almost like a, a, a different set of, of boundaries and, a different set of things to overcome, you know, in terms of, you know, age and people are underestimating you because of that. And then there's also, you know, just being female and being a woman of color. And so, you know, there's just so many things that you have to navigate. And so, you know, when we do look at Black women as a group, we have been historically underrepresented in political offices. So can you share some of the unique challenges that you may have faced um, as a Black woman in politics and how you've overcome them? And, you know, just some of the joys that have been, you know, some of the, the, the hallmarks of your, your, your young career in, in elected office. Okay, well, definitely I'll start um, with the challenges because you got to start there before the joy come, you know, of course the storm come and then, I mean, the storm come and the sunshine comes after. So we know how that go. Um, I would say coming in or actually running a campaign it can be hard because if you do come in during a time where you may not have a lot of finances, a lot of money, or you may not have a lot of backing in regards to um, a party backing you up or possibly um, certain... Um, like political groups. Yeah, certain political, political groups. groups right. Club or, you know, things like that. It can be difficult. So the work is, is harder. So so you out actually knocking doors, you on the ground running, fundraising, 
And a lot of times you have been not a lot of times you have been knocking by yourself. There have been days that I was outside knocking on my own up until, you know, a certain time, I say up until closer to the general. When I got through the primary, it was like I proved myself. Because knocking doors, you know, you got a lot of um it's kind of like a a um with the generational like uh age differences gap. where it's like are you yeah. old enough to run for yeah. i had so many people oh like I, I, had so, I had so many people <laughs> my apologies i had so many people asking me that coming to the door like are you even old enough to vote <laughs> so your age is questioned a lot a lot of times um and the knowledge that you may have to be able to right. serve the community when your passion is there i think that takes you a, that takes you a long way um that was one of my biggest boundaries uh the age um the finances at first you know just making sure that you get young people i had a lot of young people that were in my team on my team that actually helped uh, me during um, my election season, knocking doors, fundraising, assisting me, trying to um, text message any family, friends, whatever, emails to try to see how we can actually come up with the funds to get the materials that was needed to actually campaign. So I would say that was one of the, strugg the struggles that I had actually running during the campaign. It actually ended up working out for me. Um, I ended up getting endorsed by a few um, elected officials along with the NAAC, I'm sorry, with the UAW, um, NAACP, um, and a, other, a few other um, unions. Um, also, I was um, endorsed also by the 13th Congressional District at that time. Um, so during the four years, I will say this. As a as a black woman that is elected, mm -hmm. it's hard sometimes. You you actually have to sometimes work harder than your your colleagues. So you have some you know the males you may not they may not work as hard as you. You may have to work extra hard to prove yourself. Right, right. And it's, it's all the, the it's not necessarily that like the job, the nature of the job requires you to work harder because that's politics. You know, of course, you know, any any job worth having is going to be requiring some elbow grease, but it's you're working that much harder to overcome, you know, just systemic barriers and, you know, other, you know, problems of perception. And yep. so you have to work hard to prove like, you know, there's an image thing, you know, and um, we'll get a little bit into like the world of how you have to dress a certain way, you know, being, you know, a politician and, mm -hmm. you know, to look a certain way and the image is so important and respectability politics and all of that. So, yeah, I, I definitely get it. <laughs> you said it, you said it. And I would say those were struggles that I've faced along the way. Um, and then to be honest, you know, you know, you know, being elected, um, sometimes being elected is a, um, can be that thankless, like thankless position where it's a lot of times you're, you can be attacked or you won't get the thank you sometimes that you think you deserve, but at the same time, you're not doing it for that. You're actually doing it as a whole for the whole entire community as a whole. Um, so the positive that I've gotten out of this is that I've been able to serve the city that I was born and raised in. Some of these people that are my constituents are my teachers. Mm. Uh, people that raised me, um, people that have been in my life, you know, uh, mentors, all type of people in my community that I'm able to serve. So them seeing me um, being able to be young and come back and be elected and uh, create policies and assist with bringing development and, you know, being able to um, help the city to flourish has been again a big blessing and I, I can do nothing but thank God for that so you know that's that's what my journey has been so okay okay and this sounds like a beautiful journey and uh, you know that is one thing that I think 
too few people emphasize that, you know, a lot of us get into it for the altruistic reasons and we stay in it, you know, even though there can be personal attacks, there can be a lot of, you know, just drama for no reason that have nothing to do with the legislation, nothing to do with the policies. And, you know, we stay in it because we love it, because we we yeah. get we get this, this boost of exhilaration from serving the people. And it's, it's about being selfless. It's about, you know, giving and, you know, yeah. giving yourself and you know just really being able to warm the hearts of 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 people and change minds and you know help educate people on you know things that directly impact them and encourage them to show up and participate in local government and you know then encourage them to participate in higher levels and to under to help them understand like yeah. what the difference is between a state rep and a state senator and then you know a congressperson and you know a, a senator at the federal level so yeah. Yeah, I think those are those are the rewarding aspects of you know this this labor of love and um I think it's so funny that you you ch chose to hone in on like the, the fact that this is all about servant leadership and it's not really it's not about us at the end of the day no. you know? um because there was um at my day job, we just had a new person start. And, you know, um, my my background in politics was brought up. And, um, you know, he's just like, I, I've always loved politics. And, you know, is it as me as like, a, he's like, I love talking about politics. And it seems so exciting. Is it as exciting when you're in it? And I'm like, no. <laughs> it is thrilling. It is thrilling yeah. to, you know, I love even being a part of campaigns and going out door knocking. Oh I think man, I love campaigning. Connecting with people <laughs> door knocking, I think was, you know, really just one of the most exhilarating. So like every year, actually, since I got involved in, you know, public office, I have gone out and knocked for other candidates and yep. engaged with Same people here. to like ask like okay what do you think about this policy and mm -hmm. this is on the ballot so what are your thoughts and you end up talking to somebody for 30 minutes on the front step or get invited back for like lemonade or whatever yeah. so yes yes I think that's that's really the beauty in it and what we truly you know why we want to commit ourselves to a life of service because you know we definitely especially at the municipal municipal level I think you know, I don't think a lot of folks realize that it's not something that pays, you know, six figures or something like that. And so you're, you're largely volunteering. And so you do it out of the love of servant leadership and servant, you know, that, that calling. So, um, you said uh -huh. it. yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. So, um, I do want to pivot a little bit into, um, how do you feel like the presence of, Black women in politics can lead to more inclusive and equitable policies for communities like Inkster, because I do think that, you know, um, Black women have been having a moment, you know, they're, you know, since the election of Kamala Harris as vice president. And I think that, you know, seeing more Black women in, in positions of leadership and representation, um, it also kind of brings to mind that there are still you know, social determinants of health that, you know, there are disparities and, you know, there are also disparities in, you know, pay and, you know, just, just uh, mort mortality for, for, for Black women in, in um, you know, just like maternal health. And there's, there are so many levels, but um, there's also the fact that, you know, we're having seats at the table and demanding conversations around what true equity looks like. Hmm. So I will say, I think it's um, very important for um, Black women to be elected and to serve underrepresented communities because them themselves come from those communities, know what the constituents need or what policies that uh, would affect us as Black women. So, um, I think too, um, and let me. Can you repeat that question again? Because I know we kind of went in, we went into it. We went into a little segue. I'm known yeah. for like being the host that I that goes off on a little bit of a tangent. See, see, no, 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 no. This is what happens when you when you like me and you haven't talked in a little bit, and so then there's so much to talk about that I'm like yeah. doubling up questions. Um, but 
So like, do you believe that the presence of black women, just a mere presence in the elected representation of black women in politics can lead to more inclusive and equitable policies for communities like yours, like Easter? Oh yes, definitely. Because if someone, if black women from again, unrepresented areas are actually um, speaking and advocating for people like ourselves that look like us and actually went and go through the same things that we go through, policies, the policies are definitely going to be um, centered towards helping us, you know, because every, you know, they know because, you know, they went through it. And not only that, they come from the community, so they understand. And that's why we definitely do need that. We need more Black women to get elected. Like, that's what I'm, I'm 110% uh, try to focus on trying to help either way it can when people are running um, trying to help knock doors for them uh, making calls giving money whatever I can do to assist to help them to make their journey easier because I know that they're very much needed in office to represent us Okay. Okay. I love that. I love that. So, you know, at the heart of it, representation matters and seeing examples like, you know, of yourself, you know, um, this is why I'm a champion of, you know, just kind of seeing more, you know, uh, underrepresented folks in fields like STEM, you know, science, engineering, technologies, because if you see examples, then you know that it's possible. You know that there's, exactly. a job. um, you know, I was recently at a meeting where people were talking about when I went to Wayne State and Wayne State has historically been either a commuter school or it's a lot of first generation college students, you know, that make up the student body. And, you know, with that, there are a lot of students who have not been exposed to the types of careers that exist out here. And so when you see somebody who comes from the same background as you, you know, really in, in a role that maybe you didn't know that there's a clinical psychologist and you, you know that you're fascinated by the mind and, or you didn't know that a community liaison was a position that you could have, you know, working in Lansing. And so, you know, you know, you want to do things with the community, you know, you're going to school for political science. And so, you know, you really want to find that connection. And I think that seeing people doing those things is, is like really, really important to be able it, to it is. see it yourself, is. imagine yourself mm -hmm. in that position. Being able to see yourself in them, you know? And right, that, right, right. Okay. Okay. So, all right. So we talked about what inspired you um, to, to get into politics, but like, was there a specific thing that kind of like, you know, was the thing that like, okay, I'm putting my hat in the ring, you know, I am running, you know, and it's, it's right now, this is my moment. So like, what was that moment? Was there something that made you mad, something that, you know, made you feel inspired? And it's just like, I have to do this. You know, what was that, that, that one crucial thing? You know, that's a really good question. I've never had anyone ask, ask me that question. I just have to think real quick. And you took me back to a time oh uh, well um we had the youngest um elected official in the office really um when city council here that was 18 at the time and then um i never i never thought he was that young i'm just like wow, yeah, he was 18 he was 18 still in high school and he's still high, just wow. coming out of high school wow. literally just coming out of high school and then we went from that to being the state, state representative. So I helped on his campaign, of course, um, during city council, um, along with state representative. And then with uh, Betty Jean Alexander, assisted her and uh, other, other few people who ran, even in the city of Detroit as well. So when I seen him run, I'm like, you can, okay, they're open to young people running in the city. For a long time, growing up, all I've seen a lot of the city council members are were usually retired. They were a lot mm -hmm. older. So that was that opened me up to be like, okay, they're more they're open to young people actually being in office in the community. So I was like, you know what? I'm I'm assisting everyone else. I you know, I I'm in the community, I'm helping, you know, I'm connected. I'm 
bringing resources back to the community. I'm helping as much as I can in regards to the NAACP because I, I used to sit on the executive committee on the legal redress committee at the time. And with the 13th Congressional, um, I was also a delegate. So I would come back to the community and tell people about who's running and when to vote and help people with um, putting together, get out to vote events. And I'm just like, you know what? It's my time. It's my time. And this was really around the time that my grandmother, my grandmother actually passed um, February of 2020. So in 2019, I say from 2015 to 2019, I was actually my grandma's caregiver and conservator for a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, she came straight from Trinidad and Tobago um, and came here to Wayne, Wayne County and worked at Eloise. I know you heard of Eloise at the time. She started there, which was, I uh, believe, she worked at the like Wayne County Hospital, you know, and she moved to Inkster, got a house in Inkster. My, my grandpa, he worked for um, Ford at the time, came from Alabama. He bought a house here. So seeing my like grandparents and the fact that they came to this small city and being active, like my grandma was very active in the community. I mean, more in churches than anything in the church would give back to the community. But when my grandmother, when she got sick and my grandparents started getting old, I just felt that it was kind of my time to give back as a whole. So give back to my grandparents, assisting them and helping them. And then, you know, I was like, okay, let me give back to the community too, because this is the community that they raised me in. And I, I really want to, I think, make my grandmother proud along with the fact to come back and do something that a lot of people don't do because a lot of times people will leave this community go to school and then keep it moving they won't come back you know um when i first ran it was funny a lot of my friends that i grew up with in my neighborhood it's like you crazy you you went to school and you coming back home you know so you know that was really what um uh, what pushed me because one my grandparents helping them um just being pushed by the fact that i think again she was sick and giving back to the community already i want to make a difference and then seeing also like talking to a lot of people from my neighborhoods and people that i grew up with that went to school with me because we went to university of michigan a lot of them they left they're not coming back you know um not probably didn't get raised in some of the best areas, but at the same time, the fact that I came back and was able to give back to the community and I didn't give up on them is really what kept me going. You know, I didn't want to give up on the community that didn't give up on me, you know, because a lot of these people, again, they raised me. A lot of these people were school teachers, but, and they still active, you know, in the community. I got some people that's on a um, senior agent, agency, on, um, agent our, our group is like a senior group that we have here and a lot of them were my teachers people that helped raise me some of the people that were in church my deacons and all of them they're still active today and a lot of organizations still here you know and I think that's, that's the beauty of communities because you will see, you know, um, I know here in Harper Woods, it's like, you know, we got the same volunteers who are, you know, um, the retirees who, you know, you remember from from growing up when, you know, you would go to different school events and they would be there, you know, helping run this organization or that event. Um, and so, you know, that's the beauty of it. It's just like these these are folks who are you know, entrenched in the community, invested in it, and they they stuck around. And so um, it's beautiful when they get to see you grow up. It is yeah. just like, oh, it's like <laughs> right, but right. And you get to grow to like, you know, be with them on that respected level. And I, I do love that's the, the fun thing about um, sort of the generational differences, you know, in, um, you know, uh, politics when, when, you, when you get in there. And it's just like, you know, I always feel so comfortable and at home around like my, my older citizens, 
uh, neighbors and friends. And it's like, we can just talk for hours. And then I hear mm-hmm. from, like millennials and I'm like, what are you, what are you people about these days? I'm like, yeah. I don't I'll be hanging out with my you know so so I do love that that is that is the beauty in it um yeah yeah I want to I want to take some time to pivot into like a very fun category that I have started using I actually borrowed oh. another podcaster okay so rapid fun. fire fun kind of softball questions and you okay. you know take less than a minute to answer all of these and oh, then man okay my, my closing question put my thinking cap on right now okay. okay no 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 <laughs> I ain't gonna be nothing like that it's gonna be real like <laughs> levity okay okay all right okay real quick fall highlights for you what what is a like a big thing about fall that you always love oh um, i like halloween and dressing up Ooh, like, oh. yes okay okay <laughs> all right and along that same vein what is your favorite season my favorite season is summer i'm a summer yeah. baby Born June the third. Oh, friends, how are we for? Okay, so that's the thing. I feel like most people who like summer were also born in summer because I do like winter, even though fall is my favorite. So yes. because I was born in the winter. Okay, um, you know, what's your first memory or awareness of politics? Like, what what's your first presidential election you remember, or like hearing about it, or knowing, being aware that politics exists? Okay, this was Obama's when uh, Barack Obama ran for president. That was the first time I ever voted. Okay, okay. I was, college. I was excited. Uh-huh. I was excited. I'll never forget that. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so now for, for the cu- upcoming, you know, uh, 2024 and, you know, all of the elections that are going to be going on, like the big ones, presidential, we got, mm-hmm. you know, a congressional race again, uh, all that jazz. What election are you looking forward to? The presidential election. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Oh my goodness. Um, who do you, I feel like I shouldn't ask who do you think is going to, I feel like we all know, but you know, yeah. <laughs> is, is, do you think it's going to be Biden and Trump? Because I don't, it has Biden. It's going to be Biden and Trump it. because I just checked the polls. Well, it was a few days ago and it looks like Trump and uh, Biden are the two leading from the two parties right now. Okay. Okay. All right. So it's going to be that matchup again. All right. And um, what's next for you? Oh, man. You mm-hmm. know, so I do plan on going into higher office. I'm not mm-hmm. sure exactly when that's going to happen. Uh, right now, my biggest thing is to end up going into law school. And um, I'm working on a political um, consultant um, company right now. I actually, um, my first client was last year, um, Devontae Sherrod was a council person in Ecorse, mm-hmm. and I helped him to uh, try to run for mayor um, in the city of Ecorse last year, and really, really close. It's like probably about 20-something votes off, maybe 20-something, 30 votes off. That's beautiful. I said 20, 30. Was he yes, running against exactly. an incumbent? It was like, I would say it's about 30, 30 points Okay. Off. This yeah. was against an incumbent? Yes. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's a like, long time. Like, yes, yes. A long time. Um, I think he's been the mayor for the last eight, no, ten years. Mm. Ten years. So this was another young person, close in age, like you and me. Um, and it was it was fun. It was fun. So I'm looking to assist and help um other young people run and help them in the campaigns in any way possible. I've been able to learn from running my campaign and helping other people running their campaign. So I'm pretty excited about that. And um, like I said, law school, higher office in the near future. I'm not sure exactly what um, office exactly yet, but I'm praying about it. And when I hear from God, that's when I'll move on it. But um, at this moment, I'm going to take me a fresh uh, breathe. Be able to live a little without a lot of the constraints and all that, and still be able to give back to to the community. I'm not going to leave the community. When I find um, something else to do, I'm always finding something to do. I never sit down. So, um, try to either create a nonprofit or um, something to assist in the community. I'm not leaving. Still mm-hmm. going to serve, not in the same capacity. Um, but yeah, I'm excited about the future. Okay. Um, the future, yeah. 
that's that's beautiful that's beautiful so like okay so there's excitement around the future um I do actually want to know like um you know talking about building a legacy and things like that and you know running for higher office or you know so what are some of the legislative um you know policies or initiatives that you as a councilwoman have been a part of or you know spearheaded or championed that you are most proud of right now Hmm. I would say I'm very actually proud of the economic development more than anything that we've been bringing in. We know policies, and I'm going to get to that. I know we know policies really impact the, uh, the community, um, but our community really needs economic development, and that's the truth of the matter. Um, we have a lot of abandoned buildings going up and all up and down um, Michigan Ave. A lot of the community, we don't have operate businesses or we have closed down businesses that's been sitting there for years. Um, we was able to, we had an old library, we was able to um, generate or get a grant money from um, Senator Dana Pohanke um, okay, okay. to actually get that going and now we're turning that to a cultural um, museum to actually put our culture and everything that us, that makes City of Inkster and be able to um, show that, show that culture in the museum. Um, we also been able to bring an amphitheater, small little amphitheater um, in downtown. Oh, that's pretty big. Yeah. Like, like any type of construction and development, like new construction, new development. Yeah, is it's, it's needed. Thing. It's needed because it's visual. People can see it. And I'm not saying people don't care about policy. That isn't even the thing. It's just that I know that we're, we, you know, this community, we need, we got to build up the community so people can actually get hope from seeing, seeing stuff, you know, we can make policies all day, but I'm telling you, this community care about the economic development part of it and seeing these old abandoned buildings that have been sitting here for ages, actually being able to be something to be done with it. Um, we was able to actually get $2.4 million from also uh, Congressman Congress women, uh, Rashida Talib, um, to actually put into our um, in our Booker T. Dozier Recreational Center and add a second piece to it, which will be a senior um, rec. So it's just directly be for the seniors and seniors only. They've been wanting that for years. It's been long overdue. Um, there's also more development that's coming downtown Inkster. Um, we had an old city. City Hall building that's been sitting here for years, I mean, ages. And um, we were able to team up with a organization along with Nokia. So Nokia is coming to that building to um, build free, and not build, um, and I'm not saying, I hope, excuse me if I'm not saying this correctly, but it will be internet, free internet. To, so to make this a um, internet accessible community. That's that's beautiful because yeah. that's one thing that, you know, there's always a digital divide and there's like- Fiber optics. That's yes. Oh, okay. Fiber uh, optics. I'm not the best, I'm not- All right, all right. And like, so high speed web high for speed everybody. Making and, a smart city. Beautiful. We'll be the first like smart city. Awesome, awesome. Yep. Yes, because that and is one thing a lot of folks end up having to go to the library to, you know, just make use of the internet and yep. have access to it. And, you know, during their limited hours, it's like, where else do you have to go, you know? As exactly. We're mm -hmm. not being able to afford it, you know? Right. Right. And um, we also just did the, we had an Inkster Ice Arena or Ice Arena in Inkster for years. And we were able to turn into like a soccer, uh, like soccer, um, sports and recreation personal and training yeah. yeah so it's the inkster sports arena um and then so we we got a lot of development happening um i'm very proud of the economic development that we got going on even also in regards to my district alone there was a lot of abandoned buildings and all of the buildings now have at least businesses coming into them um now, going back to a policy, um, I would say the policy that I would say that I'm very, I'm most 
proud of actually being a part of would be, hmm. I would actually say I may want a policy to be honest, capping mm-hmm. that off. Because that, okay. that has been a very, there's been I'm a lot going on with that. There's been a yeah. lot going on with that. Um, That was actually something where it was a lot happening and there wasn't teeth in our policies. We finally put teeth in our policies, so we capped it off. We capped it off. We do have a, probably a lot more than we should have because I think we have like a total of ooh, one, two, probably about six, six different dispensaries in the city of Inkster and 6.2 square miles. So it's not that many. It's not that big. And it's probably about 26,000 residents here. So six is a lot. But I've been glad that we've been able to cap it off just so we don't have to have that conversation going forward. So the last thing we need is more medical marijuana dispensaries. I hear you on that. I do think that, like, I know our community, well, I mean, like, our community here in Harbor was, we, we, it's been a very hot button topic. And, you know, I know I was leaving city council when we were deciding on these. And, you know, in some ways, it's, it's like a double edged sword. And it's tough for people who are the decision makers to really, you know, their, their, their pros and their cons, you know, no matter what your personal opinion on, you know, marijuana and, and the usage and things, there's, there is a tax, you know, and sort of financial incentive to, you know, just really be on board with the, the just marijuana facilities, you know, coming into your community. And then, you know, you can hold them to community benefits ordinances and, you know, just make them build you a community center or give towards, you know, just mentorship or things that can positively benefit the community. But then, there's also the aspect of you know the I don't know all these these you know things that come with it where there it can be ugly it is at the end of the day a vice and you know I know it's it's medical in a lot of cases but um you know a lot of people will still view it in old-fashioned ways where they're just like oh it's it's a problem it's an addiction it's a gateway drug and so you have to deal with um you know just the pers- negative perception of it and then you have to look at you know the the financial incentives which can be good for communities and so it it can definitely be a tough space to navigate and a tightrope to walk when it comes to you know just the whole conversation around legalized marijuana and the facilities that come into your community so yeah that's yeah kudos to you guys for navigating it Ooh. and just being able to cap it you have more control when you put more teeth in your ordinance because we know a lot of communities and a lot of cities that's a hot topic in a lot of cities in the state of michigan and again being able to put teeth in the ordinances making sure that it's not close to daycares, making sure it's not close to schools or nurses. And which in a small town can be hard. I mean, it's because they are oh going to be like, you know, literally, I know Harper Woods is 2.6 square miles or so. And so anywhere is going to be close to a school. We have a high school, a middle school, and, you know, uh, two other kind of sites that, you know, operate as high school, middle schools combined. And so you're going to, anywhere you put it, it's going to be close to one of those. It is. It really is. And I think that's one of the policies. When you, when you said policy, I'm just thinking like, okay, we've done, I've done a lot of policies. It's been like four years. But the one that sticks out the most is the one that the community has been going back and forth for about for years. I mean, you put that on, you put that on the actual agenda you get way more people to come out than usual. <laughs> I remember going to the most recent community meeting we had on talking about, you know, just marijuana um, facilities and expanding them or allowing them here. It was literally, I've never seen our city hall so full. It was out of the door. There was no, it was standing seat only. And it was just, I've never seen a council meeting so well attended or even um, the planning commission like this they went before the planning commission and then they went before and I served on our planning commission for like six years and no one ever came to those meetings yeah. ever 
Yeah, and you got to be careful because a lot of times people or business owners will only come to the community for that. These mm-hmm. A lot of these people that are the business owners that own those dispensaries don't live here, not are not yeah. from here, you know. So it's profitable. You know that it's a fight. It's profitable in regards to profitable for them, but it, it helps us to bring finances there. But we don't want that to be our main source of business, you know. Um, and again, we also want to be able to control it. So I think tapping it, saying no more, completely no more, tapping it, you got an idea that now when you leave out, you know that it won't be any more coming in. Now you can be able to work with those businesses to give back to the community or trying to sponsor police officers or assist them with give back during the holidays. You can actually work with those because a lot of, again, a lot of times they these these own these business owners will come into the community, get a dispensary, come here for that reason, and keep it moving. Right, right. And on that note, we do yeah. want to, you know, close things out and ask you a question around any advice you would give to, you know, a young female person of color who wants to run for office and, you know, doesn't know where to start. Where would you recommend that they they start if they want to be invo- involved in politics? Ooh, I say do it. You know, a lot of people will try to push someone sometimes to, to not do it or say you're not qualified. If you have a passion to do it, do it. And then also join your local organizations, try to get involved, see what issues is going on, get involved in going to your um, city council meetings. Um, just try to go to the meetings, planning meetings, uh, planning commission meetings, see what new businesses are yeah, coming. You'll be the only one there, so you'll get yeah, a chance to be one-on-one with, with yeah, everybody. You know, and a lot of people don't go to those meetings, but those are important because you get an idea of what's coming before you even hit council. Before you even hit council, so you can have an actual awareness of what's going on. Or if you have an opinion, you can actually express that opinion and know what's going on. So the biggest thing is knowing what's going on in your community being involved in your community and, and trying to be a part of organizations um, and also your congressional district being involved in that way as well because that's where you meet a lot of people that's already doing what you want to do or what you plan to do and so finding those mentors or people that can lead you along the way to give you the direction that you need to run a good campaign um, that's where a lot of times you'll meet the people who love working on campaigns or help run campaigns or assist you and know how the hows and what to do with run with running your campaign, making sure that you follow your campaign finance <laughs> completely correctly. Yes. That will that's because really those kind of things will send you, you know, to jail. And you know, yeah, that's thing. it's it's like that's the one area where <laughs> so many people get in trouble in politics because every you, time you definitely want to make sure that you know, and then also just even, you know, committee filing, committee to elects and all yes. those things. It's just like, I think those are so many things that people don't recognize are, yeah. you know, that you have to do. And I think a lot of times people get so overwhelmed. They're just like, ah, that's not for me. And it's just, uh, no, don't, don't be so afraid that you don't ask questions that yeah. you, you know, you don't, yeah, I know, I know people can be really thrown off when they go to a city, city council meeting. They're like, I want to come here and talk about how, you know, the rats are chewing through my garbage can. And, you know, I need to talk to somebody or the street lights were out on my mom's street for like a week. And I'm like, we need to talk about why this is happening. They want to come and they want to address their, t- their question. And then you got Robert's rules of parliamentary procedure. Uh, where everybody's like you know, making motions and, 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 and resolutions and eyes and yays and nays. And, that will throw people off. I've literally seen people walk out of, you know, small, you know, elected meetings, whether it's school board or city council or another type of commission. And I think that can be daunting, all of the, the you know, pomp and procedure. And, you know, it's a deterrent and people will just walk away. Yeah. Or just also, too, 
getting on the ballot, the being able to have to get the petition signed, to making sure that you're doing your paperwork correctly, in downtown, making sure that you're doing, or getting your bank, making sure that the bank is correct. So mm -hmm. it's like, it's a lot of steps in that. And honestly, I don't think I would have learned a lot of that stuff if I was not part of the 13th Congressional District, because I had a lot of mentors and a lot of people who also ran campaigns, uh, either, you know, worked on campaigns or was elected. Right, so right. The district, so, district yeah. the congressional districts is really important. And also, that's when then going.